I'm going to read the first chapter of the second part of my novel, Mudville. I read the first section in four parts, it, available on videos on YouTube, so check that out. This part begins in 1930 in the Dust Bowl in Arkansas. Chapter 1. Dust everywhere, born with every footstep, little clouds with nothing resembling rain inside, floating for a moment above this bone dry earth. On his boots and trousers, in the pores of the fabric, on his hands and face, given everything the look of clay, and he thinks of ancient Indians, a book he read once long ago of a world far from here of adobe houses of mud and brick dust, red like the faces of them Indians baked in the swelter, day after day, generation after generation, under this thankless sun and strident sky, stuck to the cliffside like hornet's nests, to the side of some long dead barn. The taste of earth like the ground, a powder of dead bones, a dust and ash, and shadows, and people like himself who once walked this earth and breathed through hope and loss and despair and hope again, that I will be the one who makes it out of this place, that I will be the one who'll escape once and for all the consequences of my birth. On his lips, granular, dry, and lifeless, robbing his mouth of the last drop of spit, the taste of nothingness and the end of things, of finality and memories that are almost gone. In his veins, with every breath, he takes it in like a blood transfusion, this brick dust that's all that's left of them ancient Indians, that's all that's left of this land beneath his feet, of his daddy, who he never knew, his bones still here somewhere. Somewhere down deep in the soil where there still might be a drop of moisture. A drop of moisture left over from that last rain that fell about 40 years ago, it seems. With every breath, the air in his body is replaced with it till it's in his lungs, in his blood, in his piss. And he watches as that yeller stream hits the dirt, the dirt so hard and dry that piss just sit there on top like a, like a liquidy yeller eyeball looking back. It sits there rejected and desolate, rejected by the earth, so many years without water that it forgot what it was like. Or maybe it remembers, maybe it remembers everything. It remembers how it was to open itself to a cloudburst, to God's supposed mercy, to the cool, clean water seeping into every pore, giving it life again. And perhaps it thinks this, if indeed the earth can think. And it sees that all it gets nowadays is goddamn yeller streams of piss. And it says, no, no, sir, fuck you. And it sits there dry and hard as adamantine, silent and stubborn and spiteful and so dry that only the weeds will grow. And he feels the dust in his eyes as if it's all he'll ever see. James, you going to town? What? I says you going into town later. And he stands there motionless as the earth, waiting for the slightest breeze as if he was dust itself incapable of movement, inert, till something comes along and kicks it into a cloud. No. What? I says, no, I ain't. All right, you don't have to bite my head off. Jesus. Seconds pass. Minutes, hours maybe, who knows as he stands there like a statue, like some rust-stained monument of some Civil War general shit on by pigeons. So, you gonna get some more water then? Huh? He turns to face her. I mean, you're holding that there bucket. You gonna fill it? 
And it's then that he realizes that bucket's in his hand, that for God knows how long he'd been standing there with that goddamn bucket handle digging into his fingers. Yeah, all right then. And he watches her walk back to the house, the little dust clouds like detonations every time she takes a step. He looks at her hard. He tries to see his wife in there somewheres. He tried to see it before, for the past year, in fact, ever since Alma died when their new baby was born. How can two sisters be so goddamn different? He asks himself again and again, and he sees Alma's face all contorted in some kind of agony, like it was going to be tore off by descendant demons. With every contraction, with every push, she watched her lips peel back, her teeth set like a steel-jawed trap, her eyes bulge out of their sockets with bloodshot veins, and the sweat, the sweat dripping from every pore till her hair was soaked, her face, the bedsheets, the nightgown she wore for the last time. And he looks down at the earth that swallowed up his daddy, that swallowed up his wife, and he kicks that goddamn dust with his boot till he can ride away on a cloud. The handle of that pump feels cool to the touch, even though it's goddamn summer. Even though the heat has been unrelenting. This southern blistering sky that's malevolent, that beats down like so many fists. Specks of rust flake off onto his fingers, rough, worn, and calloused, cracked and desiccated like the goddamn earth now, blood metal on dust-colored skin. The strain of the handle, the squeal of rusty iron that's sick and tired of being moved, that wants to stay put forever, that's so goddamn lazy and recalcitrant that James has to curse its existence and damn it to hell before the water will finally flow. He hears Alma's voice, her cries and whimpers, her screams as if she was dancing with death itself. At that first glimpse of his daughter, he knew right then that something was wrong. He knew right then, because the first time when his son was born, it was different. He ain't no doctor, he ain't no midwife, but he knew it nonetheless. And that scream, that blood curdly scream when his newly born daughter come out, that cry of terror as if she knew at first glance what a goddamn shithole this here world was. As if she didn't want to make another breath, take another breath of this pestilent air, and them demons was there all around the bed, the ceiling. They ripped at Alma's face. They dug their claws in deep like gargoyles so they could drag her down to hell before she could hold her baby hold her dead baby just once in her arms. The bucket is full as he walks it back to the house, the house that he was born in some 40-odd years ago, the time of the great fire when this town was still called Mudville. Here's the water, finally. What? You see them dishes? They, don't go no, they ain't going to wash themselves, Abigail says. And I can't wash them with no water. What? You ain't got no legs? You ain't got no arms? Oh, so you want me to do everything, is that it? So as you can just sit around all day doing nothing on your lazy behind? Some man you are. And it's beyond useless to tell her that there ain't no work no more to be had. Not for no one. Not since that goddamn Wall Street fiasco, which sent the whole goddamn world, it seems, plummeting towards oblivion. And how did it even happen, he asks himself. How did it happen that what some rich sons of bitches did in New York City reached all the way to Bandit, Arkansas, this town that used to be called Mudville, back when he was a baby, an infant, with no recollection of the world and its evils, to this here house he was born in, where his wife and daughter died in the same godforsaken moment?
And it's beyond useless to tell her that there ain't no need to carpenter since no houses are being built. Since them houses built already are being foreclosed on by them same sons of bitch bankers like them ones from New York City. And he stares at her face for the millionth tr time, trying to catch that one last glimpse of Alma. I declare, I don't know what Alma ever saw in you. And it's beyond useless. James takes that rifle of his from the rack above the fireplace. The old Winchester repeater, the centennial buffalo hunter, the same gun used by old Teddy Roosevelt, the, the same model, that is. And he pours that box of cartridges onto the kitchen table and then puts them in his pocket. Where are you going? Abigail asks. Get some food, all right with you? She nods, then turns back to the dishes. <laughs>